so puzzled, Floyd? Body service on Suburbans got you baffled? Well, kind of, Tech. I'm not so sure I can cut the mustard. Well, you'll change your mind in a hurry, Floyd. I'm going to cover operations that anybody can tackle after a little practice. It just calls for some common sense and patience. Oh, maybe so, Gary. But besides the common sense and patience, I'm going to need more know-how. Well, say no more. We've got a suburban tailgate job here that'll help us clue you in. This tailgate glass doesn't operate as smoothly as it's designed to work, but adjustments are provided to move the gate, the glass run channels, or both whenever it's necessary. Now, uh, what you're trying to do, basically, is fit the gate, then adjust the lower glass run channels so the glass will enter the upper channels in the opening without binding. Now, uh, the upper channels, of course, are not adjustable. Do we start by checking the tailgate fit? Yeah, that's right. And if you find it necessary, the tailgate can be moved fore, aft, up, or down by loosening these hinge pivot plate adjusting bolts. There's also a side-to-quarter adjustment provided. Loosen these pivot anchor screws in the gate hinge bushing. Move the gate as needed and retighten the screws. Now, here's what you're after. Uniform spacing at the sides. And there should be about one-eighth inch clearance between the upper corners of gate and the lower ends of the side moldings. Now, in addition, the gate should fit flush with the panels to within about one-sixteenth inch. Well, uh, how much vertical adjustment is there in that gate? If you find it necessary, you can move the gate up or down about one-quarter to three-eighths inch. Aim at the best possible fit so the gate will latch correctly and won't leak. I get the picture, Tech. Except for the striker adjustment. Well, you adjust the strikers for a flush fit with the panels and for a tight seal against the weather strip. Don't move the strikers in too far, or the gate will bounce back without latching. In other words, here's where patience counts. Move the striker in far enough for a flush fit and consistent latch engagement. Close and open the gate as a check. Now, you may need to move the strikers more than once. You can add or remove shims behind the striker to improve rotor engagement in extreme cases. I read you, Tech. But this job won't need any shims. It latches good and the tailgate fit is fairly neat. Yeah, it looks pretty good, Floyd. Nice job. Now, let me show you how to improve glass operation. We'll have to remove the cover panel, garnish molding, and paper water shield. Close the gate and raise the window to about one half inch below the roof rail. Then, see if the top of the window is parallel to the roof rail. If not, loosen the four regulator plate screws and level the window. I see. Level up the glass first. What's next? Well, we line up the glass run channels in the gate next, Floyd. Loosen the top and side screws at the top part of the channels. Also loosen the screws at the bottom of the channels. Now, turn the upper run channel attaching sleeve nuts counterclockwise until the boss of each nut is against the inside of the inner panel. Then hold each sleeve nut as you tighten the lock nuts. I see. The glass frame holds the upper ends of the gate channels in alignment with the body channel. Right, Floyd. Now for the lower ends of those gate channels. Run the window assembly about halfway down. Then tighten the lower run channel screws on both sides. Loosen the lower stop screws next. Then run the window down so the top of the glass is even with or slightly below the top of the tailgate outer panel. Hold the stops up against the lower glass frame and tighten the stop screws. Then get out of the car. Open the tailgate and tighten the two side screws at the upper end of the glass run channels. I catch, Gary. That about it? Nope. Close the gate and run the window up and down to see if it works easily. That's the best check on alignment. Now here's a tip, Floyd. If the glass binds as it's raised, run your finger up and down the upper glass run channels to check for tight spots. If the run channel's pinched, you'll have to spread it a bit. Okay, Tech, we will do. Speaking of interference, on some early jobs, you might find that the upper ends of glass run channels can't be adjusted far enough forward. If so, remove the glass assembly and both glass run channels. Cut or grind off the staples that hold the glass run rubber channel and remove the rubber. Rework both metal channels by cutting about an inch off the tops. That will eliminate interference and allow extra fore and aft adjustment. Install these new glass run rubber channels.
by using a two-coat cement application. Then reinstall the reworked channel assemblies in the gate. I see. Then adjust them like we did these. Are we ready to button this gate up now? Not yet, my boy. Got a drill drain hole. Yeah, tech's right. We're going to discard this paper water shield and install a new gasket on the cover panel instead. But we've got to make sure water isn't trapped between the cover and the inner panel. So, center punch the 12 places I've marked. Then use a 5 16th drill to drill the holes. Be sure each hole is on the shoulder so no water will be trapped above the gasket. Now you can reinstall the garnish molding. Put a bead of sealer at each corner. You want to make sure water doesn't get in at the upper corners of the gate. Here's another tip. That garnish molding can cause hard window operation. The glass must have ample clearance at the gate opening. Yeah, that's a good point, Tech. That garnish molding could interfere and need repositioning. Now, usually, you can loosen the four top molding screws and remove the end screws. Then, roll the molding forward to eliminate interference and retighten the screws. If end holes don't line up, drill new holes and fasten the ends down in their new locations. If the molding still interferes, try this. With pliers, crimp the forward legs of the molding attaching brackets. That will move the brackets and molding attaching holes forward. In extreme cases, you can break the bracket welds, then relocate all brackets forward. Drill new holes and fasten the brackets with sheet metal screws. And sometimes the molding's not at fault. It could be the inner panel that's causing interference. Oh yeah, Tech, that's a good point too. That inner panel could be bowed or pinched too close to the outer panel. Now in a case like that, open the gate to its wide open position Use a bumper jack in its highest position so the lifting tongue can slip under the inner panel. You follow me? Yep, carry on. Now, with your foot on the jack base so the jack won't slip, press down evenly on the ends of the gate. Bow the inner panel back up until the opening between inner and outer panels is as uniform as possible. A couple of firm shoves ought to do it. Now, here's something else. Be sure the garnish molding end flange doesn't interfere with the upper end of the run channel. That can put extra drag on the glass. Very good. Got any more tips up your sleeve? Yep. If there's still excessive drag on the glass, remove the glass run from the channel in the upper body opening. If the corners have knife cuts, replace it with this new glass run with the slotted corners. Molded walls on the new glass run are thinner and provide more glass clearance. When you install the glass run, be sure it's centered so the lower ends will seal at the gate corners. And cement each leg for seven or eight inches to keep the glass run from creeping out of position. And for good measure, when you have the tailgate cover off, lubricate the regulator and latch linkage with recommended lubricant. Then cement this new gasket to the cover panel and reinstall the panel. That's a good idea to open and close the gate as a final check on the striker adjustment. Also run the glass up and down to check channel alignment and ease of operation. a boy, Gary. Now hold things up a second, because somebody's got to turn this record over so we can talk about service on tailgate locks. Now let's suppose you get a case where the tailgate latch doesn't work right. That can happen if there's a maladjustment, interference with the linkage, or a remote control rod that slips out of the latch assembly. In any case, You'll have to remove the tailgate cover panel, the garnish molding, and the paper water shield. Should I discard that water shield any time I take one off? Good idea, Floyd, because you're going to put on that new gasket we showed you before and drill those drain holes. Take the glass assembly out, too, so you can get at the locks. Look first for some sign of interference between the remote control rod and inner panel. If you find any, rework the inner panel to correct the interference drill, cut, or file to get enough clearance. After that, synchronize both locks by adjusting this screw on each side. Now, besides that, make sure the nylon block bearings have the same settings. The nylon block bearings? Look here, Floyd. Notice that the nylon block bearings have four possible positions. So set both nylon blocks on their highest step and place them against the inner panel. Oh, I get it. Both bearings must be set the same. Right. Now inspect how well the remote control rods engage the keyholes in the latch mechanisms. Under severe use, a rod can jump out of its keyhole. 
Now, if that happens, the rotor won't release and the lock stays locked. Sometimes the end of the rod jams the lock, so the rotor freewheels. Now, to guard against that, bend the tangs on both sides inward for better rod engagement. Check operation and watch the rod ends to see that the rods stay in place. Okay, Gary, a good tip. I'll keep it in mind. And here's another. The lock spring that holds the take up on the latch might jump off its pad if the owner forces the latch too much. If that happens, remove both latch assemblies. Turn the rotor to take up all the free play. Then bend the tab to hold the lock spring more securely in place. Do that on both latch assemblies so spring effort is kept in balance. Lubricate both latch assemblies. Reinstall them and adjust them to synchronize their locking action. Then, as a final check on lock operation, close and open the gate a few times. If it works easily and locks securely, you've done a good job. This one works like a charm, Gary. Guess we did okay. Well, that's good news, Floyd. Don't forget that the inner panel should have 12 drain holes. Then, reinstall the glass assembly and the molding and see that there's enough clearance for the glass. In addition, be sure the cover panel has the new gasket cemented in place. Reassemble the cover and you're done. Very clear, Gary. Anything else on Suburbans? Well, remember that the tailgate glass on all Suburban models is bonded to the window frame. It's available as an assembly through Crico or Mopar. Side windows on all new two- and four-door hardtops and convertibles, except Imperials, are also bonded glass. Rear doors on four-door Imperial sedans use bonded glass, too. And it's used on side vents on all 59 and 60 models, except on Dodge trucks. Looks kind of sharp, Gary. At least I think so. Bonded glass is better styled, all right. Now, what's more, it's stronger, quieter, and a more stable setup. Each custom-fitted unit also has the necessary hardware attached to the frame. So it's easier and quicker to install. In other words, use nothing but, hey? That's right, Floyd. Now let's talk about seats. There are occasional cases when a suburban second seat or seat back may need adjustment. If the seat cushion is out of line, fold the seat forward, pick up the mat, and loosen the three mounting bolts on each side. Move the seat side to side, fore or aft, to equalize or square the seat so the legs will contact the shelf angle properly. Now, in addition, make sure the hinge nuts are tight to prevent noise. The seat back hinge pivots, incidentally, are mounted on inner wheelhouse brackets that have a serrated top portion. Remove the molded cover that conceals this bracket, then loosen the bolts to raise or lower the seat back. How about that once-in-a-while condition when the second seat legs block the entrance? You mean those legs can sometimes stick up instead of folding back? Yes, they can, Floyd, if there's interference between the cushion panel and floor mat over the drive shaft tunnel. That makes the seat sit too high for the legs to kick back and nest properly. So, push the seat cushion forward. Fold the floor mat forward, too. Remove the jute padding where the seat compresses it against the drive shaft tunnel. The cushion will then sit lower and the legs will fold back away from the entrance area. On three seat Suburbans, the third seat back and cushion also have adjustable mountings and supports. They can be moved if necessary to get a level cargo carrying surface. Good deal, Gary. Anything else on seats? Well, with the exception of Valiant, all 60 models with manual front seats have a new custom positioning six-way adjustment feature. So, once you find out how an owner wants the front seat adjusted, you should tailor it to his personal preference. You can adjust the front seat forward, rearward, up, down, and even tilt it to suit the owner. In addition, the two-way seat adjustment handle at the left can still be used for the usual forward or rearward movement. Each seat track ramp is mounted on a six-way slotted base. Each base has a movable support plate connected to the seat track and a stationary support plate securely attached to the floor. Horizontal slots in the movable plate permit forward or rearward adjustment. Two curved vertical slots in the stationary plate permit raising or lowering to one of three positions or tilting the seat to any one of four angles. Just loosen the adjusting bolts enough to permit free movement. Move both sides of the seat at the same time, then retighten the bolts securely. Good enough, Gary. I'll have no trouble with that. 
Yeah, Floyd, no sweat. Now, another body condition I'd like to cover is a water leak in the header area on a convertible. Now, let me show you on that convertible in the shop. Check the top header to windshield header fit first. For example, if the top header is too far forward, it'll strike the windshield header and won't compress the seal. Now, to correct this, lower the top and remove the roof rail weather strip retainer. Next, remove the rear screw from the underside of the header and loosen the other three header to roof rail screws so you can adjust the header rearward to eliminate interference. You'll have to enlarge the rear screw hole before you can reinstall the rear screw. Tighten the two screws under the roof rail first. Tighten the two side screws last. There's more on the header to roof rail adjustment in the reference book. Okay, Tech. What's next, Gary? Well, you can use a hose to test for a leak under windshield header. A leak here will show up along the windshield molding on the inside of the car. On a case like that, wiping sealer under the front edge of the header is your fastest fix. A permanent correction is to remove the moldings and cement a strip of 3 8 by 1 half inch closed cell foamed plastic along the top of the windshield weather strip. Very clear. Any more tips? Oh, sure. Now, if there's a bad gap at the lap joints, you'll have to remove the side moldings and reposition them. The inner end of the side molding should butt against the top catch. You may have to grind off the weld flange at the upper end of the windshield pillar to get a good side molding fit. To improve the lap joint fit, drill a hole about a half inch from the inner end of the side molding and install a sheet metal screw. A gap at the fillet can be reduced by reforming the end of the side molding. In addition, wipe sealer into the joint and you're done. How about the new top header weather strip, Gary? The one with separate end pieces? Yeah, I was just getting to that. The new weather strip has a longer sealing lip and does an excellent job of sealing over the lap joints. It's a closed cell, molded, contour conforming weather strip. It'll reduce latching effort too. Right, Tech. Now, before installing the new weather strip, remove the top header molding. Remove all of the old weather strip and the top locating pin seals. Installing new seals is kind of tricky, so follow the instructions in the reference book. Tech's right, Floyd. Now, to test for a leak under the top header molding, apply a stream of water from the rear. If there's a leak there, it'll show up at the latch holes or at the joints at the side where the header laps the roof rail. To correct this condition, remove the header molding and re-cement the waterproof tape to the top fabric and the weather strip. Make sure all staples and tabs are covered. Then, replace the header molding. If the tape is damaged, use a new strip. You can inspect for a possible leak at the vent wing seal from the inside. Latch the top down securely, close the door, and see if you can see a pinhole of light at the upper edge of the vent glass. If you spot an opening, check from the outside of the car. If there is a leak, you'll probably find that the sealing lip doesn't seal along the top edge of the vent. Now, you may have to trim off the top of the seal so you can move it up enough to get a good sealing lip fit along the top edge of the vent. You may have to install a new seal to stop a leak at this point. Oh, I get the picture. But I wonder if I'll remember all your tips on sealing. <laughs> hey, relax, Floyd. This reference book has the whole story. Good news, Tech. I don't want to fumble any body service jobs. That's the spirit. Now, practice what we've covered, and you'll find most suburban and convertible body jobs a lot easier. Thank you.